It's Friday, January 21. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. One of the country's leading producers of chicken is advising that the price of the meat will increase by 10% this month. Jamaica Broilers Vice President Dave Fairman says the cost of production and raw material has forced the company to increase the price of chicken. He explains since last year, January to December, their energy costs has gone up somewhere in the region of 61% and the company has been absorbing a bit of that increase. The cost of chicken per pound currently ranges from $180 to $290. On Thursday, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bessessa McKenzie gave some updates on the fourth COVID-19 wave sweeping the island. Young adults reflect the strongest demographic of new infections, while most of the fatalities are seen among our seniors. With respect to the type of um, cases that we're seeing in terms of the age groups, we're still seeing our highest numbers within the 20 to 29 age group and the 30 to 39 age group. So it is still the young adults that we're having the greatest amount of, amount of exposure and these persons are coming down with COVID. Next slide. Our case fatality is still highest in the older population with a 19.8% case fatality in the over 90s, a 14.6 case fatality rate in the 80 to 89, and 70 to 79, 9.5% case fatality rate. With both the Omicron and the Delta variants of the virus in community spread, the virus saturation is being seen from end to end on the island. These cases are distributed right across the island, and the community map that you are seeing on the screen will show that how densely we are seeing the number of cases in St. Catherine and Kingston and St. Andrew. But right across the island, we have 76.5% of our communities, a very high level of geographic spread, 599 communities out of 78, 783 communities have confirmed cases. The CMO was speaking at Thursday's virtual COVID convo press briefing from the health ministry's headquarters in Kingston. Now that she has made history as Jamaica's first female chief of staff of the Jamaica Defense Force, Rear Admiral Antoinette Wimis Gorman has outlined her priorities. Among them is tackling Jamaica's culture of violence. I commit to decisive, firm, and strategic leadership, which is required in today's complex and ever-changing security environment. Over the past 29 years of service to the force, I've acquired valuable tools and honed the skills required to prepare me for this job. The JDF chief says the Army's role is, among other things, to support the Jamaica Constabulary Force in managing crime. It is a reality that the JDF will continue to play a critical role in the national security apparatus of our country. My efforts in this regard will be anchored in the five pillars of force transformation which is articulated in our strategic defense review. These are capability development, human resource management, infrastructure, and command and control. This will ensure that the force is fit for purpose and capable of effectively confronting current and future threats to Jamaica's security. When Ms. Gorman officially took control of the JDF from outgoing Chief of Defense Staff Lieutenant General Rocky Meade at a change of command parade at the JDF's Up Park Camp headquarters in St. Andrew on Thursday. She held the rank of a Commodore and she's now titled Rear Admiral. The government of Jamaica and the European Union has embarked on a partnership to support citizens' security in Jamaica. The program, which was launched on Thursday, is being carried out in a multi-ministerial approach to guarantee a balance between the security of persons and their democratic coexistence. Minister of National Security Dr. Horace Chang says the move signals more than the strengthening of the long-standing bonds of friendship between Jamaica and the European Union. The program is being financed 
to the tune of 20 million euros. That's about 3.5 billion Jamaican dollars through budget support. Brigadier Roderick Williams explains the aim of the program. The plan as designed is strategically aligned with the National Development Plan through the National Security Policy and Plan Secure Jamaica and is effected utilizing an evidence-based and targeted multi-sectoral approach around three prioritized outcomes. The first being crime and violence reduction to include, of course, initiatives to build institutional and technical capacity to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of the state in reducing crime and violence. The EU's ambassador to Jamaica, Her Excellency Marianne Van Steen, says the launch comes at a crucial moment. The government's citizen security program, which we support, is seeking to reform the approach to crime and violence. We are not yet seeing, and we're not even yet expecting, immediate results. And the current spike of violence is more than only regrettable. But we do support the government's aim to look for structural changes, to coordinated all government interventions, to actions that are based on evidence-based data and with a focus on prevention. This approach takes more time, but we firmly do believe that it should lead to better results in the long term. The funds are being directed in particular to the zones of special operations in order to have measurable results as it relates to reduced criminal activity and improved opportunities for the residents to engage in self-improvement and empowerment initiatives. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chan explains. And this particular program is not only seeking parenting and all among its the outcome that are being monitored is of course training opportunities for young males and young, young adults, but in particular young males. And in this year, the Jamaica Defense Force has, been, has had its role expanded and is doing a phenomenal job in both the National Service Corps and through the Military Technical Academy, which is offering programs that attract young men. We have young men coming too, but the fact is that truck driving and construction still at this stage of development attracts more males than females, which is what I want to see happening, that we can take off the street at all times, the young, disenchanted males who we need to occupy productively. Minister Without Portfolio in the office of the Prime Minister, Floyd Green, says the pilot of the National Identification System, NIDS, will be implemented during the second half of this year. Speaking on Thursday on Power 106 FM, Minister Green explained that residents of Kingston and St. Andrew will be the first to register. He says the pilot would give the government the ability to see if there are any changes, any nuances that need to be fixed. The National Identification System, called NIDS, is a unique, reliable and secure way of verifying an individual's identity. It will establish a reliable database of all Jamaican citizens and will involve the issuance of a unique, lifelong national identification number to every person. Registration for the Grade 4 Primary Exit Profile for 2022 administration will be done electronically. The Ministry of Education and Youth is advising that registration will be done via the PEP online registration system, which can be found at pepregistration.moey.gov.jm. The registration portal is now open and will close on February 15, 2022. The ministry explains in a statement that the age eligibility criteria for registering for the Grade 4 PEP 2022 are students born in the years 2011, 2012 and 2013. However, the only exception to this is if there is documentation to prove that the student is a ward of the state or has special needs. Former Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Dr. Grace McLean, was interdicted on Thursday. The interdiction means Dr. McLean will be barred from returning to work until decision is made in relation to an ongoing investigation. Dr. McLean had been sent home on paid leave in October 2021 to facilitate investigation into a report by Auditor General 
Pamela Monroe Ellis regarding the payment of $124 million to the Joint Committee for Territory Education. The interdiction will remain in place until the authorities decide, among other things, whether she will have to repay some of the money which cannot be accounted for. We now get an extended business report from Gabriel Thompson. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, January 20, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $156.67. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $125.06. The pound sterling traded for $213.53 and the euro sold for an average $180.51. In Thursday's trading session, the following reflect the movement of the JSE indices. The JSE index advanced by 1,250 points to close at under 400,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 66 points to close at over 3,000 units. The JSE combined market index advanced by 1,823 points to close at over 400,000 units and the JSE All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 1,466 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 107 stocks of which 50 advanced, 36 declined and 21 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services Limited and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited and CAC 2000 Limited. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% preference shares, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited and Consolidated Bakers Jamaica Limited. Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited was the volume leader with over 15.2 million units, followed by Express Catering Limited with over 2.8 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units. In market data for oil prices plunged on Friday after rising to seven-year highs this week as an increase in U.S. crude and fuel stockpiles prompted investors to take profits from the rally. Brent crude futures dropped $2.46 to $85.92 a barrel. The contract earlier fell by as much as 3%, the most since December 20. The global benchmark touched $89.50 a barrel on Thursday, its highest since October 2014. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures slid $2.61 to $82.94 a barrel. The contract earlier fell as much as 3.2%, also the most since December 20, after rising to its highest since October 2014 on Wednesday. The recent rally in crude prices appeared to run out of steam on Thursday when Brent and WTI ended the trading session with slim losses. Both benchmarks have gained more than 10% so far this year amid concerns over tight supply. And before we go, another video from the Bank of Jamaica Empowering You video series. Today the question is being asked, is my money safe? The central bank says yes. Once you save at a licensed bank, you are covered by deposit insurance up to $1.2 million per depositor per bank. You're good to go now. Hmm? Kind of nervous. Me, me don't know why. Opening an account is no big thing. You have nothing to worry about. Something about me do. Talk fast, because my class is supposed to start online in 10 minutes. When I open the account, how I know my savings in the bank will be protected. Suppose I follow your advice and put my hard-earned cash in at the bank. And the bank crash. What kind of protection I wear out for my money? You will know how hard I work for my money. My darling, the love of my life, would I lead you astray? Hmm? 
You ever hear about deposit insurance or the work of the Jamaica Deposit Insurance Corporation? No. What is deposit insurance? All depositors at any licensed deposit-taking institution are entitled to free and automatic insurance for their deposits. Once you open an account at a commercial bank, merchant bank, or building society, JDIC protects you with deposit insurance. That don't, don't sound bad. But, 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 so, this deposit insurance cover all my money? Deposit insurance cover your savings account to the tune of up to $1.2 million for each depositor. That sound good. Excellent. And remember, deposit insurance is only for savings accounts in any commercial bank, merchant bank, and building societies. Deposit insurance doesn't cover other types of services like investments. When you have time, check out the JDIC website at www.jdic.org. Or you can call them at 876-926-5225. Write that down and give it to me later. And remember, BOJ as the regulator, make sure that the banks are safe. As long as we money see if anything happens to the bank, make good to go. In news from across the region, prank calls have a negative, even fatal impact on someone's life. And this is what health officials in Grenada are trying to avoid, especially at a time when the coronavirus pandemic has put a strain on personnel and other resources. Acting Medical Director Dr. Tahizia O'Donnell is calling for an end to prank calls to emergency departments as this takes away from getting help to those who really need it. Acting Medical Director Dr. Taisha Donald is appealing to the general public to stop making prank calls to emergency departments. I can confirm that we have had these prank calls and, you know, it's, it's, it's actually very sad that this is happening in the midst of the pandemic with the a number of cases that we have and persons seeking medical care. So I would really like to, to, to uh, you know, ask the pub public so work with us. Please work with us. Think of it like this. Now, if you do a prank call and there's someone, a family member, who actually needs to have that ambulance call, what would have happened is that the resources would have been deployed to an area that is not needed for an area that is actually in dire need of that service. So it means that what would happen is someone who needs urgent care would be deprived of that care because of your prank call. Dr. Donald, speaking during Wednesday's post-cabinet briefing, said the practice is affecting the system. I mean, we've had instances where an ambulance would go to our household and the persons there don't have any idea why the ambulance is there. And then you have the, the other instances where ambulances go out and, and then no one is there. So we have the, the two scenarios, no one is there, and the other scenario where the persons within the household have no idea why the ambulance is there. So I really want to ask persons um, that we should really stop that practice because it's, it's affecting our system and it's actually deploying a uh, service to an area that it's not needed. And persons who really need that service will not get the benefit of it. Meanwhile, the acting medical director is appealing for patients among the population as increased COVID cases are having a negative impact on staff at health facilities. She said that a number of healthcare practitioners have become ill. So what, what, what has had to happen is that we had to crunch. So whereas persons who would have been scheduled for surgeries and so, we had to now put it off and divert to just urgent cases, urgent and emergency cases. So all the elective cases, meaning cases that are scheduled and um, it does not have, having the surgery today or tomorrow does not affect the person's well-being. Um, we had to put these cases off, right? So, and then, of course, it means that this person, whatever problem they're having, they, of course, they have to bear with it for a little longer. 
And then in terms of, for example, places like the accident and emergency and our outpatient clinic, um, it's become very challenging because, of course, the wait time sometimes to access care is longer. Dr. Donald said these challenges are affecting services at both the community health care centers and the hospital levels. In the Bahamas, the Ministry of Education has announced that students across the country will return to campuses for face-to-face -face learning on Monday. Megan Shepard joined education officials in a brief tour of schools on Thursday morning. In anticipation of the reopening of schools, Minister of State for Education Zane Lightbourne led principals and union officials on a tour of schools on New Providence to assess their readiness for hybrid learning. He says he is satisfied that campuses are ready to receive students. We went to C.B. Bethel, Doris Johnson, Sybil Strawn, and Eva Hilton. Lightborn added education officials have been working closely with the Ministry of Health to establish new safety protocols, including temperature checks, sanitization stations, and nurses on campus. There's an isolation room that is different. The isolation room is supposed to be an area that the nurses can do their, their assessments safely by not exposing others to the, the person who they may have suspected has COVID or, or maybe have need to have isolation or have been exposed to COVID. Now the state minister adds that there may also be some changes to the curriculum going forward, reducing the number of courses offered to students. He says the goal is to allow students the opportunity to focus on core key subjects that will help in their overall development. We are strengthening the technical component, which is my portfolio. And we want to make sure that school will have not only technical teachers and other teachers that have to perform duties to make sure that students get quality education, but students have catch-up programs where they can get those things that they would have lost. And we may have to cut out the number of subjects that we offer students in certain cases to make sure we focus on literacy. Former educator and executive of the Bahamas Union of Teachers, Quentin LaRota said, he believes the delay in resuming face-to-face -face learning caused many societal ills. He welcomed the reopening of schools. The loss of education, the abuse of the children, the lack of proper, proper socialization, the inability of parents to find uh, proper care for their kids when they have to go to work and so forth, uh, a psychological impact. So it was a negative situation all around. And um, the risk reward, I think it's, it's better to have school face to face for the country and, 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 and for the nation. Uh, we were able to do it successfully in Grand Bahama. Reporting for our news, I'm Megan Shepard. We kick off today's sports with football. Jamaica's senior national team, the Reggae Boys, was blanked three goals to nil by hosts Peru in Thursday's international friendly in Lima. Peru dominated ball possession in the match, and Luis Iberico, Alex Valera, and Yashimar Yotan all found the back of the net for the hosts. Prior to the match, Reggae Boys coach Paul Hall said he would use a friendly to help select a final squad for the upcoming round of World Cup qualifiers. This exercise that we're playing against Peru, we're using it to look at the players that I haven't seen before. So this is a chance for those guys to stake a claim to say that they should be in the first team and they should be in and around the first team 23 when we play against Mexico, play against Costa Rica, play against Panama. Currently, Jamaica, with seven points, sits at sixth position in the group qualifying stages. Hall and his predecessor, Theodore Whitmore, were part of the historic France 98 team. He shared his thoughts on the country's chances of another qualification. Of course, they have to. I mean, as the coach, I can't really say anything else, and I have to believe it myself. Um, I have to inspire the rest of the players to believe it as well, and everybody else that comes with Jamaican football who's got the, the hopes and aspirations of the country. We need to be able to believe and, and have that belief in ourselves like we did all those years ago when we did it for the first time. Over to golf, Justin Burrows and William Nibbs are some distance off the lead at the end of the first day of the 7th Latin America Amateur Championship, which is being played in the Dominican Republic at the teeth of the dog golf course. Burroughs is eight strokes off lead, while Nibs is 18 shots behind the leaders. 
Segundo Olivia Pinto of Argentina and Roberto Neves of Puerto Rico are joint leaders on a six under par 66. Boros is tied with 12 other golfers in 36th position and Neves is 94th place. Their position on the leaderboard at the end of the second today will determine if they continue in the championship as there is a cut line at the 15th position. Burroughs made the cut on his previous two outings, while Nims, who is in a precarious position after day one, is trying to do better than he did in 2020, his first time by making the cut. Uh, yeah, so bad day today. Um, but for the most part, it was good. 15 solid holes, only th three really bad ones. But unfortunately, golf has played over 18 holes. So just have to take the positives from today and work at it for tomorrow. And hopefully put in a good score so that I can make the cut. Over now to cricket based on the rankings with South African women at two and West Indies at seven. The matchup feels like a David and Goliath clash. The four-match series, which starts next Friday in Johannesburg, will be another chance to add a trophy to the cabinet. The bigger picture is fine-tuning for the Women's World Cup in March in New Zealand. For West Indies, they will hope for consistency in batting, which they did to good effect on the last visit in 2016 and won that series. Head coach Courtney Walsh spoke to Newsroom Guyana at a virtual press briefing on Wednesday. The bowling, the bowling has done the job for the, for the team. Um, mm -hmm. But what, you know, as you prepare for the, for the World Cup and on this tour, what kind of targets, if any, would you have set for your batsmen? What would be the benchmark you would like to see from, from them as you, you get ready for this, for this um, World Cup tournament? Well, obviously, Matt 50 was out is the first target and benchmark I want to have with batsmen in, in, in place. So if we can do that, um, I think we're going to need enough score. Assess the conditions that we're playing at. On the normal conditions, you want, you want to score at a certain amount of runs and over. So you're looking at, you know, with guitar with an average score of 240, 250, you want to work with. But not all of the service are probably going to give you that. Or not all the teams you play against, you can get that score. So you have to assess every opposition and where you're playing at. But if we can score consistently in those in that area, 240, 250, you know, 230, 270, then you give yourself the best chance. You're going to have low scoring games from time to time. But that's what we're trying to create, that we can be consistent in getting over the 250 mark as a, as a guideline too far. You know, I think 230 and above, you want to try and do that consistently. Uh, if you play well enough, then you can get closer to 300. So we have not ruled anything out, but it's just having a little bit of consistency with all the battles. And everybody contributing in a, in a team effort. The, the players who you know give you big scores, you can get a little bit more for this for the team total. So that, that's what I'm hoping to see. How how important would it be for the players outside of DeAndre Dutton, Stephanie Taylor, and, and Haley Matthews to, to get runs in, in this series? How important is that going to be going forward? Tremendously important, and we have said that. Um, you know, we have expressed that to the team, and that will be said again when we when we regroup and have our teammates and team discussion. Because you don't want it to be a three a three a three ladies team, um, especially in the back department. And we have we have ladies who, who can hold their own and who can do well, and that was evident um, in the series over. And you know, a couple of the players reasonably well in Pakistan. So if we can have the other players putting their hands up and giving that support. So it takes a lot of pressure off DeAndre, a lot of pressure off Stefan, and a lot of pressure off Haley. They can relax and enjoy the game a little bit more. And if other people put scores on the board and they can continue to do so, then the tools, as I've been mentioning, you know, we will be able to get those targets a lot easier. So it, it, it's going to be a combined effort from everybody. And as you say, I don't want it to be just those three. We want other people to be coming to the party as well. And that's our package. On behalf of our hard-working news and production team, we wish you pleasant viewing.